We've been supportive of these these efforts to you know kind of do a lot to the game to, to speed it up and um, the one you're talking about should increase the running game. You know the analytics revolution has you know had a lot of changes to it as you know in the game and one of them is that when the stolen base percentage drops below about 75 percent, in other words the success rate, um, teams just don't steal and you right. know it's kind of borne out in this in the stats but it just gets boring and i think you know these changes should bring that percentage up if you want to just think about it in pure analytics terms which will make the risk reward worth it for teams and uh, you'll see a lot more of the running game and so that plus the pitch clock which will speed things up uh, and the shift elimination and i think the cool thing about the pitch clock for me is that what they've found in the minor leagues is not only does it speed up the game but it adds to the number of balls in play and so there's more action, and you kind of go, well, wait, why is that? The game's the same, but the, it's just quicker. Well, no, it's, what happens is what they found is pitchers um, don't have as much time to recover, and you wouldn't think, you know, 30 seconds would, would be enough, but it is for guys to throw in max velocity to kind of recover just that much more. And so if they have to get up and throw right away, um, you know, suddenly a tick or two and velocity goes down and more balls are in play. So all of these changes I think are good for the game will make it more exciting. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I truly am, and uh, it's going to be interesting. And and even the signing of Wilson Contreras, uh, I, I made a note earlier today, something I wrote at uh, scoopswithdannymac.com about, you know, he's had seven pickoffs the last two years. Uh, he's got uh, an excellent pop time. He's got one of the strongest arms. This is a guy who, uh, if, if if teams are going to try to steal more often, you, you have a guy behind the plate that's going to be able to counteract that to a, to a uh, in a pretty good way because that that's kind of the, his strengths, that kind of stuff. His arm is great. His pop time is really good, and that should help the Cardinals as well. Yeah, I think that that skill will start to be valued more than it has been in the past too, right? We talk about the, the runners, um, you know, benefiting, but, but those catchers that have great arms will also benefit um, because they'll be, you know, more impactful. And I think, you know, hopefully he's that guy for us. Hey, uh, I know we're going to talk about the Hall of Fame, but I did want to ask you, because I'm very much on your side on this, uh, I've been grousing here and there about uh, legalizing sports wagering in, in in the state of Missouri. It's way overdue, and I know you went down there to talk to some of the legislators yesterday, but can you give us an up or earlier this week, I'm sorry, can you give us an update about where that stands, and are you more optimistic than you've been uh, on this matter? Yeah, it's been a, a long, winding road. Um, we've been going to Jeff City now for the last four years, and all of our surrounding states have it. And um, whatever you think about gambling or, and or sports betting, the reality is it's happening. It's happening in all of our border states. Missourians are crossing rivers to, to go place bets. And if they're not doing that, they're just doing it illegally and not enforcing it. So it's not taxed and it's not enforced. So – we really believe that it's the right thing for Missouri to finally get on the bandwagon on. Uh, but, but stepping off of my soapbox and just giving you um, <laughs> probabilities, which is I think what your question was, I would say um, I think our chances are better than 50-50, but they're not a slam dunk because we still have um, – we think we're in great shape in the House uh, where it did pass last year. In the Senate, you have um, – uh, an ability to be a little bit more disruptive to, to kill stuff with the filibuster rules and things. And so it only takes a few uh, to kill something. And what's happened is other issues have gotten thrown onto the Christmas tree, or so to speak, and it kind of collapses of its own weight. That's been happening. We're really hope, hopeful this year to get a clean bill, and we think if, if we get that, we'll we'll get our votes. Um, if, if not, then it will be sort of one of those you know, messy compromises that, that, that may or may not be successful. And if I may ask you this as a follow-up, and I'm certainly not uh, asking you to uh, fling insults at anyone because that wouldn't help you anyway, but if there are sincere objections, uh, what what are they? Because, frankly, I don't understand what the downside would be when, you're like you pointed out, your your state is missing out on revenue. And a business that is going to that has been taken elsewhere and will continue to be taken elsewhere, which means you're not going to be able to uh, 
benefit from the revenue. It's gone to other states. So I don't know what the downside would be. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, you do have, you know, some um, types who are just vehemently opposed to any form of gambling or gaming expansion. So, you know, that you can understand on philosophical matters, but those aren't enough to kill the bill. So why is there still a problem getting it done? And it comes down to just politics. It's, it's certain senators that have leverage that are trying to get leverage on other issues um, and basically saying, you know, you don't have my vote unless, right? So this right. is what's happening. And unfortunately, you know, look, usually winning issues ultimately get passed. And I think this is a winning issue in Missouri. Fans want it. Um, and um, and we do, you know, look, there are some other legitimate technical things. Some senators want more protections for problem gaming. We understand that. We're, we're certainly open to a larger uh, fund uh, funding source to treat that type of thing and, and other, you know, fee-based concerns, et cetera. So all that will get flushed out. But I think the votes are there if we can get a clean bill. Well, good luck with that. I certainly support it. Uh, bill DeWitt third Cardinals president with us. Uh, before we talk about some, you know, baseball matters with the Cardinals of the Hall of Fame, I, I you know, I, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't ask you just your thoughts, your feelings about the state of local broadcasting in, in Major League Baseball and especially the franchises, including yours, that have been affected by the uncertainty with uh, Diamond Sports and the uh, the Bally Sports Network. Uh, how how comfortable are you that this will be resolved one way or the other this year uh, and your fans will be able to see what they need to see and there won't be any disruption? Uh, and then a little, maybe a little further down the road, there'll be a bigger plan that where you kind of move everything uh, ahead. But which, just give us a sense of where this stands right now and uh, how you feel about it. Yeah, I would say it, it's making us all pretty nervous because um, – it's a very fluid situation. Obviously, the parent company of these 14 RSNs, of which Bally Sports Midwest is one of them, is going to go bankrupt or it's you know insolvent. It's got too much debt and not enough cash flow to pay the bills. And so um, some sort of – one of three things will likely happen. One is, um, you know, perhaps some kind of restructuring occurs where, you know, the debt holders and the owners um, – you know, reach an agreement and avoid bankruptcy. Uh, the second would be sort of like a, um, a, a prepackaged bankruptcy where you, you, you get they go bankrupt and then work it out ahead of time. And the third would be some kind of acquisition where someone else buys it. MLB has talked about maybe buying back in the rights. Um, you know, the other two sports are involved a little bit here and there, but not as much as MLB. But bottom line is, is it's, it's a little scary. Uh, it's a huge revenue stream for us, those local TV rights. And if for whatever reason in the chaos of bankruptcy, you know, we wouldn't get our rights fees or other teams wouldn't get them, that's a huge hole in the P&L. So um, how, having said that, though, Bernie, I think that I do view it as an opportunity for the industry. And here's what I mean by that. Um, if we can somehow get all these rights back to baseball or in a third party entity with restructured debt so that it's more of a you know, viable going concern, and we can sort of reset the economics with all the teams so that the rights fees are appropriate to the business model, and we can get um, a local streaming product out there so that everybody who wants to see our games can have access to the games, that's a better world for our fans than what they have right now. So ultimately, I think this resolves in a positive way for fans, but there could be some you know, pain and suffering along the way, particularly for the teams, not necessarily the fans. I don't think you'll see, you know, blackouts or any other problems accessing the games than are currently out there. Yeah, and, you you, you know, once you get through the pain and suffering and you sound mentally prepared to deal with that uh, because it's, it's certainly a, a strong possibility there'll be some disruption and some anxiety. But if you can come out of that, through that, w- with a much better setup that benefits everyone, then – Maybe uh, maybe some of that pain and suffering will be worth it, you know, because I know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because I, I know that a lot of people are frustrated, but this is true in every market, you know, with the about with the blackout restrictions and everything, I, I, you know, and it's it's confusing. I can, Listen, nobody cares about me, but um, I find myself, you know, being uh, being a customer of like almost 
too many things because I'm like, well, I got to keep that because of this. I got to keep that because of baseball. I got to do. It, <laughs> no, you're be, right. I, I mean, the, the bottom line is, even though um, we, we, everybody hated the bundle, right? Everybody, you're paying too much. I got all these channels I don't watch. Blah blah. blah. Well, careful what you wish for because now it's a customer nightmare. I mean, I you know I have all these channels. I don't I forget my passwords. I you know <laughs> I don't. You know, so everyone's talking about some show, and I know I don't get that channel. It's like. I think that has to get better, right? Because yeah. a, a product that that is a, a customer experience that is that bad in today's day and age can't last for very long, in my view. And, and MLB dot uh, TV is is really really terrific. Um, and if um, you know the, the the whole thing that everyone belly aches about, if if every fan in every market could just watch their maybe pay extra, but they want to be able to have just uh, instant access to their team's games, whether they're home games or not. Um, you know, it, it, MLB.TV could be a monster. It's already really good. But, again, a, a, a guy like me, I do have a subscription MLB MLB.TV, and I'm happy to pay it, but I can't get rid of, say, DirecTV because that's how I watch Cardinals games, you know? so Yeah, you're, you get every <laughs> game but your team, right? Right, right. And that, that therein lies the rub. And the reason they have the local blackouts on MLB TV is because those rights belong to Valley Sports Midwest. Well, right. Valley's had trouble distributing the games like they used to to all the distributors because they balked at the price. That's essentially what's happened. And so – we certainly realize that there are certain fans that don't get our games that want them. That is, that is the biggest problem here that has to get fixed. And you right. know, MLB's on the case. They, they realize that. Um, and so, like I said, some good should come out of this economic um, chaos, um, but it's probably going to take a, a little while. You know, I guess I would just pre- preach patience or, or go on to you know, the channels that do have it. And I uh, I appreciate that. I also appreciate the way uh, the comments made by Commissioner Rob Manford. Uh, he's on top of it, so that's uh, that's reassuring. And I you know I he, just like everything he had to say about it. Um, Bill DeWitt, the third Cardinals president, with us uh, here on Five Ninety Fan KFNS. Well, the Red Ribbon Committee has uh, put a slate of candidates forward. Not that this is uh, politics, but it's David Freeze, it's Edgar Renneria, it's three pitchers, Steve Carlton. Uh, Joaquin Anahar and Matt Morris. That's a really uh, that's a really attractive uh, five player field there. Um, I'd probably install uh, David Freeze as, as the favorite only because of you want to call it recency bias. It's just many many generations of Cardinals fans uh, will always have 2011 that postseason embedded in their consciousness because it was so incredible. Um, but all five are excellent candidates, so it's going to be interesting to see how this kind of shapes up. What are, what are your thoughts? Do you like the group of five, and do you think there will be a, a, a lot of response uh, from your fans? Because there's some high-profile names on that list. Yeah, I, I do. I think um, it's a good slate. And as you know, we used to do two a year, and we're kind of down to one a year because we're kind of catching up in a way. You know, we, right. we feel like we're, we're close to having – um, in the Cardinals Hall of Fame, you know, most of all the deserving candidates, but but there's still some really good ones out there. And you mentioned the list we have now. Um, there's recency bias maybe with Freeze, but, um, you know, I think the, the committee of which you're a member felt like um, that's okay. Um, that's for the fans to do. And, and as long as you guys feel like everybody on that ballot is worthy, then I think it's fun for the fans to then – vote for whoever they want. And uh, right. I personally have a little soft spot for Matty Moe because, um, call it, you know, observational bias. Uh, I remember when he was our ace and, you know, took the ball every day and or every fifth day. And, you know, when we made the playoffs, he was your guy and had really good postseason. So a 100-game winner for the Cardinals, you know, that's a, a pretty good litmus test for a, a team's Hall of Fame, in my view, on the pitching side. Um, but the others are great too. I saw Carlton just today, earlier, um, you know, at the um, at, at the funeral for um, Tim McCarver. So uh, he's uh, lurking on that ballot too. And um, even though he's known as a Philly, um, uh, was a great, great Cardinal. If you just look at his Cardinal numbers, it, it seems like he's worthy too. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, by the way, I heard uh, I got a, an email from a friend of mine. 
in Memphis, he's probably listening, uh, who attended the, the, the service today. Um, and um, he uh, he said it was just wonderful. And the speakers were wonderful, too, including Joe Buck. I don't want to leave anybody else out. But he said uh, there's there's video out of this. And I think it's accessible to the public. And he said you have to watch this because it was, it was really quite good. I'm glad you were there. Yeah, it was nice. Um, and Joe did a great job, as you, might, you would expect, of course. And, you know, I had so many years with him in the booth for the World Series and playoff runs and um, some great video at the beginning, you know, not only um, talking about his, his uh, career, but just what a well-rounded human and individual, very intellectual, very curious, and um, a, a life really well-lived. Um, it was, it was sad, but, um, you know, he, um, he left it all out on there. So it's, you know, there's a, there was a celebration of his life today. It was was very cool. And I, I think one of the coolest things, uh, since I've been writing and talking about Cardinals baseball, which is a long time, I think really one of my favorite things is, is that he came home to McCarver and, uh, you know, con- connected, re- reconnected in a, in, a, in a stronger way because of like more visible presence more frequently with uh, with you know Fox Sports Midwest, Bally Sports Midwest. Him and Dan McLaughlin were, were an excellent team. McCarver, a whole new generation of Cardinals fans got re- introduced to Tim McCarver, and he was utterly charming. And then for him to go into the Hall of Fame, the Team Hall of Fame. I mean, I just think it was so beautiful that he was able to come back home because this guy was a huge part of this franchise as a, as a catcher, like people, I, I hope people understand how really vital he was to the, those 1960s Cardinals. I mean, really, really fantastic player. He really was. And, you know, obviously um, hit like 450 in that, in that world series. Uh, I think it was the 64, 67, one of the winning ones. And um, just, a, you know, and obviously that, that relationship with Gibson was so, well known but but you know given the time and the fact that he was from memphis and had grown up and and in those those days of late 50s early 60s the rights movement that relationship really became something that i think um was culturally significant and yes. um it just speaks to one element of of what a kind of an incredible guy he was and um and you're right him coming home that story was just a great element of his his life and for the and for cardinals fans because you know he he even said it it was great doing national broadcasts and he got to the top of his game on the ford frick award did all those world series 25 i think um but it's something about just connecting with a team and for him it was coming home and it was just a great story for us no doubt about it and we look forward to the the start of another season and actually you know with the exhibition season and uh, I, I know that we all uh, very much appreciate uh, Chip Carey. I mean, he's a friend of mine, and um, I look forward to his him settling in and, you know, in, in effect uh, rejoining the St. Louis baseball family with the family connections and everything else. So, um, you know, good good luck to to the Cardinals, and you know, and hopefully everybody stays healthy during spring training and the. World Baseball Classic, but uh, it's going to be a really interesting year. So, um, and and we're getting the closer we get, the more uh, the more I'm anticipating everything. And so, thank I'm going to when I say goodbye to you, I'm going to I'm going to tell everyone how they can vote on the Hall of Fame. But thanks for your time today. We got to do this more often. I always enjoy it when you come on. Sure, anytime, Bernie. Enjoyed it. Thanks. All right, take care. That's our friend uh, Bill Dewitt the third, and yeah, he is a friend in that. I that, listen. He can come on, you talk to him about anything, gives a thorough answer, gives an honest answer. Appreciate it very much. Some of you don't understand the thing. It's like, yeah, it's, a, it's possible to criticize a team and the executives. They should have done this. I don't know why they didn't do that. They're frustrating me. I'm angry, blah, blah, blah. You can still like the person, the people involved. You don't have to hate everybody. You know, and I don't know why that's so hard in America these days. You know, you can have honest disagreements and honest criticism. It doesn't mean that the people you're criticizing are your enemy. You know, just so I wanted to say that every time Bill DeWitt III or Bill DeWitt Jr. comes on the show, it's always a really good conversation. I appreciate it. And I thought that was a really good conversation because if you're not sure about the TV deal, you got a very thorough response, very thoughtful, thorough response. Um, 
if you weren't sure where the, the legalized sports gambling or wagering issue stood and all the Missouri sports teams, you know, lobbying the politicians in Jefferson City, you got a really good explanation of where that stands. You even got some really wonderful Tim McCarver discussion. And, um, of course, we talked about the Hall of Fame. And if you want to vote for the Hall of Fame, just go to it's, – it, it opens online. The voting opens Saturday, this Saturday, February 25th. Go to cardinals.com uh, slash or backslash uh, HOF at cardinals.com backslash HOF. And uh, I thought he did a good job of laying that out, too. And I appreciate his pitch for Matt Morris, kind of. I feel the same way about Morris and also Edgar Renteria. But listen, uh, David Freeze, uh, I'm, if, hey, if it's legalized sports wagering, I've well, they probably wouldn't have betting on who's going to make the uh, Hall of Fame. Besides, I, that would, I'd have to recuse myself anyway because I'm on the committee. But I, if I had to bet, uh, it, just pretend bet, it would be David Freeze. But you never know. You never know. It's go, really going to get interesting after this year because if we assume Freeze is going to get it, well, what happens then when we um, get to next year? Because I, I think some of these candidates – will be right back on that list of finalists next year. I hope so, because there's a lot to be said for all of them.